Okay, I just posted the agenda for today, so we will go ahead and get started so that at least we have uh, something out there. And thank you so much for being patient to my lovely Cascadians as I had to reconfigure my entire YouTube channel for this. <laughs> Which, uh, apparently Webinar Jam started with, I think it's like a new beta thing that YouTube is requiring, so awesome. <laughs> Good, good stuff. Okay, so before we get into the agenda, I wanted to hear from Emily about how the UK Seller Conference went and some of the great takeaways that we got from some of the other speakers and um, whatever you want to, to let all the great folks know about our very first ever UK Seller Conference and we were a um, founding part of that, so that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. It was a great place. Um, let's see. I can't say enough good things about London. First of all, it's a wonderful city, so it was really great to be there. And uh, the place that we were in had a disco ball, so <laughs> we got to hang out and learn under a disco ball all day, every day. So that was cool too. Um, there were some really great speakers. The whole first day was just all of us speaking on our various topics. So. Um, Lots of good people in there. Uh, Jeff Cohen has a huge fan in me. I think he's just the most wonderful dynamic speaker. So that was probably my favorite presentation, I think. And then uh, the second day I thought was really cool. Our uh, little group thing was really fun. We basically broke everyone out into groups and uh, decided on products to manufacture and kind of went through the process of how we whittle things down from a great big pot of ideas to things that are actually practical and good and uh, appropriate for uh, whatever our personal situation is, whether we're a brand new seller or a seasoned seller or what we're kind of going for. So that was a lot of fun for me. I had uh, a lot of fun, particularly getting excited with them and watching their faces light up and, oh, I can do this dog thing. So many people came up with dog things. I thought that was really funny. but. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to get excited with them about um, some of the projects that they want to do in the future. So it was a great conference. We should do it again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think was most interesting? I know, I know a lot of the stuff that, that we were talking about was um, new to you, certainly. So what, what, do you, what do you think was most interesting about the information that was presented in terms of how to choose a product? Um, I think that what was most interesting is uh, really taking the emotion out of it because for me, um, I've always approached the whole coaching thing and the, um, you know, get excited about your project and you have to have a passion for it and you really have to care about your thing and all of that is very true but at the same time it must be practical for you and so if your dream is to create a big line of, you know, baby products and you've never manufactured anything in your life, then that's not a good starting point. So maybe, you know, even though you might be emotionally attached to the idea of making really great things for babies, it, that might not be good for you. And just the process that you've laid out for people to be able to um, sort of remove that emotion and just look at it from a purely business standpoint when it's... Um, in the in the kind of research phase, I thought was really valuable information and some things that people might skip over sometimes when they're just in the passion stage of wanting to you know get their thing started. So yeah, that was good information for me. A good kind of change in perspective for sure. All about the research and the numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not always about love. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So if anyone has any questions about the UK Seller Conference, um, we do have um, some summaries of our workshop there that we can um, talk about with folks and would love to hear any questions that you guys have or any interest in a uh, follow-up conference. We, we're calling this, I forget the exact term for it, but um, the, the tax shelter conference where you can go to London and, and be a tax write-off, so not too shabby. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess it's also a good uh, time to remind about your course that you did earlier this year and a lot of the stuff we went through in our um, our day two kind of module group thing. Um, a lot of that is actually presented in a course that you have um, put together over 
a lot of months and a lot of work went into that. So, um, you know, if that is something that people are interested in learning more about, they actually uh, can do that. So that's kind of cool too. Awesome, thank you. I'm, I'm really excited you enjoyed it because uh, put a lot of time into that. <laughs> yeah, good, it was well done. Of course, it was well done. <laughs> Well, cool. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about getting ready for Chinese New Year and some of the important things that we've seen come up for clients in the logistics space. And I'm so excited to have Jennifer here with us. And um, she'll be answering some of my questions. And I know, Emily, there were some questions that came up during the workshop that folks asked you. And really interested in, um, especially timelines. I think a lot of times people get used to domestic timelines and don't think about the whole like it's a it's a pretty big globe, and <laughs> moving across it takes some time. <laughs> <laughs> so Jennifer, just lay it on us. What's some of the stuff that that you do and some of the stuff that you deal with? What are the most important things that you think that our clients or anyone watching should know about logistics in Q4 going up to Chinese New Year? Oh I'm no. We can hear you. We can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> we could do it in, in sign. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> I feel like I'm at one of those like French um, plays you know, on the street where they're like. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just mine your work? <laughs> Uh, there's two places for you to be muted, Jennifer. Check your, your dongle, but check the screen as well. Yeah, the screen has a potential mute button as well. Nope, still no sound. Her little, I see her little microphone icon blinking on and off. It's like there's something going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is the night for, for uh, technical failures, apparently. Technical difficulties abound this evening. <laughs> Interpreting things, that's awesome. Okay, so while Jennifer is trying to figure that out and maybe, maybe a reboot or rejoin, <laughs> we'll do um, item two on our agenda. I wanted to check in with Kelly about um, some of the things that we've been seeing come in, um, updates on the review side. Um, I personally have been seeing a lot of the, the type of feedback where people are like, well, what if I do this? And they're looking at the, the, the terms of service as though it's some sort of legal document that you can like weasel your way through or something. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, I will say this that I think Amazon's changes to the review policy were probably very, very overdue. Um, and as a result um, of that fact and the fact that it was done in Q4 or right on the cusp of Q4, um, people are panicking. Uh, they weren't reading between the lines, I think, in many cases about the lawsuits that Amazon was filing against Fiverr and other places um, that changes were coming. And then all of a sudden the changes were here. And so consistently I've been getting questions about, well, if I do this, is it okay? Well, if I do this, is it okay? Well, what about this? What about this? And what about this? And almost universally, every single one of those strategies was against TOS. So um, by and large, if you think there's some way that you have found to get around that, you are probably wrong. And I don't recommend pursuing it. Um, as we discussed in the last couple of webinars, you really need to invest in uh, – PPC, the, you know, doing sponsored ads, A plus content, and shoring up any best practices within your selling activities to make yourself as awesome as possible. Because all of those things are going to combine into sales. 
but trying to thwart TOS and get around the new rules is a surefire way for getting yourself suspended because I have seen an increase of suspensions and warning actions around that. They're not playing around. It's not worth the risk. So one of the things that we had questions on is, you know, well, what do I do if I can't get these paid for reviews? And um, one of the things that I had suggested was really driving a lot of traffic through social media. Yep. So one of the things that I found kind of interesting was um, when, when folks are thinking about their brands as opposed to private label products, right? So a lot of times people are just kind of just getting something and selling it as opposed to thinking about their target customer. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about like a target customer who is going to be on Pinterest, then that's the kind of person that you really want to target, right? Because you can have your images on Pinterest, you can share methods of use on Pinterest, and then have it linked directly to your Amazon store. And this is something that I think is traditionally how products have been launched, and everyone just kind of got lazy, it seems like. Yeah. I, I think so. I, I, to talking to my clients, um, I get the gamut of reactions where – some people are just, their hair's on fire and steam is coming out of their ears and they're running around in circles because they don't know what to do because they've forgotten those things. Um, other sellers are like, wow, this should have happened ages ago. Welcome back, Jennifer. <laughs> We're not sure if we can hear you yet, but we can see you. Um, but a lot of people are, are really glad that this happened, but I think the majority of people that are new to them are really having a tough time. Well, I think we can hear Jennifer. Jennifer, you're, you're live, and Audubon can hear us. Yeah. Nope. We can hear nope. you. <laughs> 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 All right, hang on. Okay, we can... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Toolbox. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> there you are, Jeremy. We can hear you. I think what this really shows is that we are Amazon consultants. We are not technology consultants. <laughs> yeah. In case there was any doubt, audience. <laughs> Right. Actually, when things like this happen, I realize how resourceful we all are, though, and how quick we work. And you know, sometimes it does take us twenty minutes, but you know, like we're we're pretty resourceful, all in all, especially between all of us. So. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> what is it they they used to say at Amazon? Everyone's scrappy. Yeah. Yeah, you do have to be a little scrappy. They they teach you they teach you to take care of yourself. So I appreciate that for sure. Jennifer. Hello. Hello. Hey, we can hear you. Don't even don't even mess. <laughs> so nice. We totally hear you. It's not a lie. <laughs> I can't hear you. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. So I think that one one of the things while we're waiting for, for Jennifer, what's the what's the other thing that might be of the most importance this week, Kelly, that you're seeing? Just things that are coming in on the performance side. Um, what are the challenges that you're seeing for for clients that are coming in? I, I think the review thing is kind of overshadowed everything else, but it's not the only thing that's happening right now. It, it isn't the only thing that's happening. You're right. Um, there seems to be a uh, to me, unsurprising uptick in actions regarding item quality, and that can be everything from condition, authenticity, uh, but also safety incident. That program is still ongoing and it's still very robust. Um, I will say that I've seen more of those instances lately. Most of them are aimed at private label sellers, but a lot of them are not. So resellers, you're not insulated from dealing with the safety and efficacy of the items that you're offering on the site. You have to pay attention to that. Um, and you have to be prepared. Uh, I think that's the other thing I'm finding is that many sellers who are getting safety warnings are really unclear about what they need to provide in order to try to fix the problem. So um, 
if you are having any kind of item quality issues in the metrics, whether it's product reviews, review, or excuse me, um, oh shoot, I just lost the word, returns, that other word, um, product reviews, returns, feedback, buyer contacts, if you're getting metrics that suggest there's a problem with your item, take it offline. Mm -hmm. Investigate. You've got to dig into what is happening, or Amazon will do it for you, and then you might not get it back. Um, prevention is worth a, a lot in this case, and I think that if you are proactive, you stand a much better chance, even if they do come to you later and say, hey, there's a problem, because at least you can say, yes, I've been investigating it for the past two weeks, and here's where we are. When it comes to the safety incidents, I think the thing that's been challenging for me, at least, to try to follow along with what's happening mm -hmm. um, is when they're asking for safety information, are they really asking for safety information? Is that really what you're seeing? Oh, that's a great question. I would say that there are some instances where I have worked on a client's ASIN being removed where I really think that the issue is authenticity. However, they're not saying that to the seller, um, but there are indications that they think that that's what's going on. And so those have required some uh, slightly different approaches and a lot of uh, very difficult conversations with clients because uh, I think there's still a lot of confusion over what constitutes a gray, gray, you know, gray market or parallel import. Um, about matching and, and things like that. I mean, let's be honest, the state of the catalog is, is a little bit in disarray in some places, especially. So, um, but I do think that that's driving some of these complaints, but it's difficult to ascertain what the real root cause is because Amazon is not sharing that with sellers when they're issuing these warnings. So sometimes it's a, a lot of reverse engineering, but I definitely think that's been a driver. So let's check and see if, if Jennifer is um, working now. Um, Jennifer, it looks like you're um, actually muted on your end. Hello. Hello. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it just took a hard reboot to get us oh. to where we needed to go. Well, when in doubt reboot, welcome. And I believe that you have a question pending regarding Chinese New Year versus <laughs> Yes. Okay. So, Rachel, you said, what do we need to be worried about for Q4? Mm hmm Okay. And then going into Chinese New Year, and when is Chinese New Year, and why do we have to care? Because I know, I know, but I think that this is something that is new to a lot of folks who haven't quite gone through this process before. Right. So, let's just talk about, first of all, um, peak season. So, peak season is happening right now. And it generally happens for Amazon between September 1st and about the 15th of November. So that means that space is tight, appointments are tight, um, you know, uh, warehousing is tight, people are stretched to their max and they're working a lot of hours a week. So if you need help, that's going to be a little bit limited. Um, there's going to be pop-up FCs. There's going to be new routings. It's going to be crazy town. So all of that to say that's okay, um, but you just have to be really crisp and concise about what it is that you're doing with your freight um, and how you're routing it and, um, you know, where you're sending it and you're monitoring it. You just have to be really on top of it now more than ever because, um the last thing you want to do is get your stuff over to an FC and have it be rejected at the door, right? Or have it be um, routed somewhere that maybe it shouldn't be going. You just, you know, or or getting late pick, getting picked up late from origin, which we have some people right now who've been like, pick my stuff up and they just haven't been on top of it. So we can't pick their stuff up. And hence, you know, it's, the beginning of November and still sitting in China. Like, are you going to be able to sell your stuff on Amazon before Christmas? I don't, I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> slim. It's very <laughs> slim chance. I mean, you could, but it's going to be like last minute stuff going on there. So just my advice going, you know, is if you can get your goods in between the 1st of September, which would be on the early side and the 1st of November, 
November, which would be on the later side, you know, that would be my recommendation to try and get ahead of it because, you know, by the 15th of November, or I'm sorry, the 15th of December, that's not, I mean, from my experience working at Amazon for several peak seasons, 15th of December, I'm like, mm, I don't, you know, I'm out. You know, people are talking about um, stuff coming into the warehouses. They're talking about stuff shipping out, and that's fine. But, you know, stock needs to be there. And if it's not there, you've missed the window. So at this point, you pretty much missed the window for ocean freight. But is it still okay for air freight? How late is too late for air freight? Well, air freight is, that's a hard thing to say because that's really a risk reward situation, right? Um, so I did some pricing for one of our clients and I'll just give you broad stroke numbers. It's about mm, 75 cents a kilo, let's just say, for ocean freight, like mm, port to door. And it's about three dollars a kilo port to door for air so you're getting yourself you know a four to seven day transit on air freight um so you really have to be aware of you know is it worth that money and if it's worth that money then yes you'll be in time right now i mean you could ship stuff um you know all the way up until probably the third week of november and still have it in stock by the first of december which i would personally say would be the cutoff like you have to have it in the warehouse um if you're doing an fba by the first of december and if you're doing like mfn you could maybe do it a little later but that's you know it's a harder sell um when people are trying to ship prime so right so so that's the cutoff for q4 so what is chinese new year and why should we care Chinese New Year, I believe, happens around the beginning of February. No, nope, end of January this year, but generally around the beginning of February. And what happens with Chinese New Year is that you get a basic complete shutdown of all services in China. Everything that you have going is just stop. And it's shut down for like a week. Um, and that's a hard thing because leading up to chinese new year you have a big push everybody's like scrambling to get stuff in so you're trying to get stuff on ships which uh if you've been following along on our blog and some other sources or journal of commerce or anything you know that the shipping industry especially for trans-pacific trade is in a little bit of trouble right now so space is um at somewhat of a premium so right before chinese new year you have that extra push where you're trying to get stuff onto the vessels and there's too much freight and not enough space and the last thing you want to do is be sitting in a warehouse somewhere in china with your stuff just waiting around um so that's the first thing and then second like if you don't hit that cutoff then you're sitting there you're just sitting there waiting and everybody is very excited and anxious as soon as they turn on the computers and open the doors, um, the day after they go, or the day they go back to work, that everybody's flooded in. So you get a real like supply demand problem, wherein there's too many people wanting to do stuff and not enough bodies to be able to get it done. And it causes real log jam. And that happened, the, the fallout of that happens over the next two to three, four weeks. So Chinese New Year is a real, it's an event, <laughs> really, and it takes a while to clear it out. So, <clears throat> like I said, you know, about Q4 and peak season, you just have to be aware of these milestones and kind of be ahead of it and really be managing to it because otherwise you're going to be stuck in that log jam and you're going to be at the mercy of wherever you're at in the supply chain. If it's not at the manufacturer, if it's not at your um, origin point, you're out of control of that, which is, it's hard <laughs> it's a hard thing to try to manage when you can't get a hold of anybody. You can't know where your freight is. You don't know what the status is. So if you were trying to get something in for, say, um, outdoor season, which would, say, start in March. Yep. Is this the same kind of situation that we're facing now with Q4, where if it wasn't on the boat to where it can arrive in November, then you're not going to sell it for Christmas. Well, that the same kind of thing that you're then facing for Chinese New Year? If, if you don't get it in, well, then you may miss a big portion of the outdoor season. 
Yes, that's true. There's a, you know, it's funny with peak season um, because let's just be honest and say there's a December 24th, you know, kind of cutoff day there. Um, it's less that way with um, the outdoor season and spring goods. Um, let me just say this about, it's like a mini peak. So if you had um, a volume chart, you'd see like Q4 and it'd be like, whoa, this big spike. And then over in like March and April, you'd see like a smaller spike. So it's definitely a spike. Um, but let me say this about the uniqueness of that spring peak, which is most of the goods um, that come in for spring are big. <laughs> like you've got, yeah. you know, like swimming pool, inflatable swimming pools, and you've got like lawn furniture and you've got stuff that takes up a lot of space. So the problem with that is, is that when you get into an Amazon warehouse, they start getting kind of tight around that time. You have, you don't have a hard cutoff date, but if you want to get ahead of it and you want to get space and you want to get in prime bins and that kind of stuff, then you probably should be you know, sort of managing backwards from Chinese New Year. So it's a good, thank you, Rachel. It's a good question because I was like, um, you know, I wasn't sort of cognizant of spring peak when I'm so focused on like <laughs> current Q4 <laughs> peak. But, you know, when you're talking about January 28th, February, you know, first, first week of February, last week of January, I mean, that's logistically speaking, global transport speaking, unless you're doing air freight, that's not too far away. You know, you have to have your stuff in manufacturing soon in order, to, you have to have POs cut soon and in manufacturing soon to be able to meet those, um, those deadlines and get ahead of that January, February timeline. Awesome. So do we have any questions from the attendees? If we don't, then we're about at our half hour. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, they can be submitted directly um, by email to info at thinkcascadia.com and we will cover those questions in our sessions. So any questions about Amazon compliance and policy, product development, um, import compliance, product compliance, we do all of the product things. So <laughs> we love to get your questions and be able to respond. Um, anything that comes up, uh, let us know. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for all of your patience with today's technical difficulties. Uh, we made it, so we got this done. Woohoo! We 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 are so excited of that. <laughs> and hopefully next week it'll be a lot easier. <laughs> hey. we will. We will. All right, cool. Uh, I don't see any questions coming in, so I am just going to say thank you again to everybody and. Good night, and we will see you guys next week. Good night. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.